It is my pleasure to chair this session titled Hemoglobinopathy and Adult Life with my co-chairperson, Dr. Shib Said, Dr. Nagla Omar. The first presentation is going to be presented by Dr. Baba Inusa. Dr. Baba Inusa is a lead consultant of pediatric hematology, Evelina Children's Hospital, uh, Guys in St. Thomas Hospital of London, King's College of London. He is head of one of the largest sickle cell centers in the UK. Dr. Inusa is going to give a talk about sickle cell treatment in the UK, evolution of services in the last 20 years. Please, sir. Um, good afternoon. Um, uh, it is a pleasure for me to be in Cairo for the very first time. I, I have passed through here, uh, through just like transit, and what I could remember very clearly was the fact that I had a very good internet access, uh, it was free of charge, and I didn't have to pay any money. So uh, thank you for inviting me, and I want to thank, I want to thank uh, the organizers. I also want to thank um, um, Amal, um, I met her at Dubai, and uh, we had talking, and then she said, yeah, you can come and talk here. And so, and it's good that I'm talking here at the thalassemia meeting, and I'm talking about sickle cell disease. Um, the uh, sickle cell disease in the United Kingdom, um, I, I just kind of wanted to um, uh, go through some of the issues, uh, some of the fact that a lot of developments have happened. And these developments have happened uh, not by accident, but by actually very active movement, participation, and active interaction uh, uh, of the patients, of the providers, um, although less so by the patients. Um, I, thought, I thought maybe it would just uh, to be good to just go through the uh, United Kingdom in terms of uh, the geography and in terms of the population of sickle cell patients. And, and you can see very clearly here, um, in, in, in terms of the, 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 the location, uh, this is uh, London, and it is well known that over 80% um, of patients with sickle cell disease uh, actually live within Greater London. And Greater London includes uh, the, the surrounding uh, um, areas that are actually within the uh, M25. The M25 is the London Orbital Road. So everybody within that area, uh, about 80% of the patients with sickle cell disease live in that area. There are other areas that there are a number of patients. Uh, Birmingham mm -hmm. is the next uh, colored area, and uh, then subsequently you could see the Northwest, which is Manchester, in terms of the number of patients in the United Kingdom. Uh, but obviously, uh, if you think about um, the the key dates, which I'm going to talk about, uh, I will just talk about some specific issues. Uh, how many patients uh, live with sickle cell disease in the United Kingdom? Uh, we did a recent survey based on a number of data sources that we have, uh, which include uh, the National Hemoglobin Registry and the Newborn Outcome, and uh, some of the initiatives that I think have had a significant impact on the management of patients with sickle cell disease. So we think that there are about a minimum of 14,000 patients, so slightly more than 14,000 patients uh, with sickle cell disease in the United Kingdom. And if you think of that in comparison with other life-threatening conditions like cystic fibrosis, a sickle cell disease is by far the most common. Um, and so I, I talked about some key dates, um, some key periods that have happened that have actually kind of changed the management of sickle cell disease in the United Kingdom. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of uh, uh, research and, and, and work that has happened, has generated from the United Kingdom. Obviously, you know, in terms of the definition, uh, understanding about the molecular basis of sickle cell disease was related to um, uh, pe people walking through the United Kingdom. Uh, but here in the 40s, they were talking about some of the key uh, papers in the BMJ uh, among the top, uh, top, top 50 uh, sickle cell disease uh, at least was about uh, the third. And uh, in the, so in the 1940s, what are the things that happened? Uh, I think you may have heard some of the stories about wind rush uh, in terms of uh, the Caribbean people coming to the United Kingdom in the 1940s. Uh, this, they're celebrating the 70th anniversary now. Uh, so because of those periods of time, there have been increasing number of patients uh, with sickle cell disease. Um, so, uh, and, and this is just kind of some of the things that uh, in terms of the scientific molecular basis that actually happened as a result in terms of work in the United Kingdom. So this was a quote about the work that Ingram did at Cambridge. 
and, and, and how they were able to actually define uh, the molecular basis, uh, the, the biochemical abnormality in sickle cell disease, and actually being able to pinpoint that the difference between the normal hemoglobin was, as, uh, was actually at position six, uh, that we fully know very clearly, all of us know. Uh, and that uh, this was because of the fact that the sickle uh, allele had um, uh, valine instead of uh, glutamic acid. So that work happened uh, despite, I mean, look at it a long time ago, and, and that is very important. So that's why we actually get this particular understanding about the pathology of sickle cell disease. Um, but actually before now, uh, in, in 19, so about 20 years ago in 1997, uh, there was a very key report that was uh, done by Alison Stridley, and this report was looking at um, the number of patients in the United Kingdom, and actually at that time identified that there were about 9,000 patients with sickle cell disease, and the majority of them were actually in London. So what happens as a result of those kind of uh, interaction? Um, and then about 1990, so between 1990 and before two, 2000, um, a number of things that happened was in 1990, uh, there was introduction of newborn screening for other conditions, not sickle cell disease. This includes universal hearing screening. So that actually became a bedrock and a foundation to begin to think about what happens to sickle cell disease. And subsequently, um, there were a lot of, um, uh, of, of emphasis when the information became very clear that there are a large number of patients um, uh, with sickle cell disease. Uh, there were a lot of lobbies, and at the time, 1997, you know, that's when Tony Blair became prime minister, and there were a lot of interaction with Tony Blair. And subsequently, in 2000, there was appointment of a director for uh, Universal uh, for actually running this newborn screening program. And in 2004, 2004, there was implementation of Universal newborn screening. And because of that universal newborn screening, I'm going to say a bit about that. So I'll go talk about it later on. Around 2008, um, there was, um, actually 2006, there was the development of the standard of care for pediatrics, and 2008, the development of adult care in uh, sickle cell disease. But one of the things that actually happened very, very important and very, very key, uh, some of the things that actually have driven change is called the NC Port Report. Uh, this was national inquiry of not national confidential inquiry on death in sickle cell and thalassemia. But for sickle cell disease in particular, because I'm talking about sickle cell disease, they actually uh, found out that uh, there were a number of practices that actually did not meet, meet um, the, the standard of care. Mm -hmm. So there was 55 deaths and actually looked at what happened to the management of these patients before they died. And some of the very key uh, findings were that if you give a patient something like morphine, the monitoring was actually substandard, fluid therapy was substandard, and actually there were issues in terms of what happens uh, when a junior doctor goes to review a patient that has pain, that has abdominal pain? You will recognize, most people will say, it's sickle cell disease, so what is the problem? At abdominal crisis. And they never think about the fact that it could be appendicitis, it could be a ruptured anything, it could be any. So we need to remember that a sickle cell patient, even though would present commonly with a sickle cell problem, may actually have other issues. So this inquiry actually had far reaching if effect and actually led to outcomes and recommendations uh, across the whole NHS to say, okay, you have to make sure you run, sickle cell survey is not run by one person, it's not run by one clinician, but actually a multidisciplinary process that involves doctors, nurses, psychologists, because there are certain issues and development that actually became very clear that uh, lack of those process actually could cause significant problems. And also people will not be able to recognize that a patient with sickle cell disease might need adequate pain control but actually, another patient that comes that is naive to uh, opiates actually may have um, a problem if you give them a very high amount of medication. So that led to kind of significant changes. So I was talking about some of the things that I thought would be important to actually kind of talk about. So universal newborn screening, when it became effective for the whole of England in 2004, um, uh, it, there were a number of things that actually happened as a result of the newborn screening. And so I can just say, if you want to kind of make anything that would make a significant difference, think about screening. Because you cannot screen if you cannot manage. And therefore, the newborn screening was implemented in 2004. 
Although prior to this, as far back as 1984, some of the centers, including our center, have been in newborn screening, but actually became a universal recommendation for England. And what happened? There are certain places that actually um, they thought, if you actually, they said, okay, like one particular area in Essex, they asked them, they said, how many patients do you think have sickle cell disease? They said they have uh, one patient with sickle cell disease in their area. But actually, after 12 months of screening, it turned out that they had actually 20 babies born with sickle cell disease. So it became very obvious to centers that, yes, if you do this, you actually could find out that actually you have more numbers and you have more responsibility. Why is that important? Is because policymakers work on numbers. If you actually don't give them the statistics, they give some ex excuses that you need to find out. But if you have the statistics and you show them, um, and then, so this was a review, a 10 year review of the newborn screening program in England. And it showed the number of babies that were screened. And actually, it showed the number that actually, so one in 72 was identified as a carrier. And one in 2000 was identified to have a sickle cell disease. And this compared to another condition, which is cystic fibrosis, is one, th one in 2,400. So it shows that sick cells is actually is more prevalent than some of the other conditions that we thought were actually the most prevalent. But actually, there's so something that actually became obvious as well, um, that obviously, even though the majority of babies were born to African mothers, there were other kind of, I mean, other racial groups that actually were affected. And, and, and in fact, some of the mothers said, actually is reverse racism. When you talk about sickle cell patient, you talk only about African black patient. But actually there are a lot of uh, patients that probably are not, there are not as many obviously, but actually it's important not to ignore them. Um, because some of the people that thought they were actually of Northern Caucasian origin actually turned out they have sickle cell and they felt they were actually not kind of being addressed. So screen actually helped and helped us to really understand some of the things. So there was this kind of the feedback. What was the feedback by the community? Because it's important if you're going to make any change to make sure that you do so um, in conjunction with in conjunction with, with community. So uh, all of this involved a lot of community perspectives. So newborn screening, there were like so many subcommittees. I was a number of some of the subcommittees. So there were public engagement uh, and some of the public engagement brought out things like um, uh, a lot of literature, but also there is something that if you check to YouTube and you watch it, I, I assure you that you're going to finish the movie. And the movie is called Family Legacy. Family Legacy, it tried to address issues uh, within families, issues of um, stigma, uh, issues as to how to manage pain, and issue as decisions and choices that families could make. So some of the, some of the quotations here, and uh, this antenatal mother say, it is important to do the antenatal uh, test. So you know it prepares you, you know. We had the baby tested uh, before delivery. If I had not had that, and I had to wait until the baby was born, I would have been nervous, a nervous wreck, mentally and emotionally, right through my pregnancy. I could not have coped with that. And the mother of a newborn baby said, if we did not test, we would not know and may miss something uh, when uh, she is uh, sick. Uh, by testing, you know that to, you know what to expect. You are better prepared. If you don't know well, how will you know your child needs special care? I'm glad I knew so I can care for her properly. And the mother of a child with sickle cell disease, I think people need to know. Uh, we must not be ignorant. It helps you prepare for the child. You can prevent complications if you know. If you don't, um, well, obviously the consequences could be quite not dire. Six screen actually leads to significant improvement in terms of quality care. Prior to screening, you could see the average age in which the babies children were presenting with sickle cell disease. And then after screening, that dropped significantly. And it's important that you see the babies very early. And in terms of the newborn uh, uh, screening, we have standards, we have requirements. If the baby is screened and diagnosed with sickle cell disease, that baby must be visited, that family must be visited within four weeks. And when they have visited after, within four weeks, the baby also must be seen in clinic by three months. If you fail that, you actually would, uh, information will go online. 
So I'll tell you a lot about the online information if I have time to talk about it. But actually, if you go online, you'll find the information about my service, about any other person's service in the United Kingdom. You can know actually whether we are meeting the standards or not. So the baby needs to be seen within three months, and the patient needs to start penicillin before three months. So if you don't do that, then obviously you fail the audit, and actually you'll be found out, because that information will be gathered during screening. So what has happened subsequently? Uh, in 2006, that's the establishment of the newborn pediatric sickle cell standard. 2008, that was the adult sickle cell standard. And 2010, up onwards, that was the institution of peer review. The peer review visits every center that manages sickle cell patients. And is visited by us who are actually looking at the patient, looking after the patient. And if people are go through, go through kind of training, to be able to actually review other services, and then you go and review a service, and I can assure you that when you visit another service, you absolutely find out that there are certain things that they are doing that you're not doing, and you learn to do them. And also there are certain things that you will find out, oh, whoa, why are they still doing this? Then actually, so what happened is that it's not only for learning, but learning is number one, but also is to see if we could have some um, enforcement of standards. Enforcing standards for families and for children are living with sickle cell disease. So the first edition of the adult standard was this one, um, but a, a totally pediatric uh, standard that was the first one in 2006, that was the second one in 2010, and all of these are available online. Um, so, and the 2008, um, the, um, some of the main themes were to provide rapid and effective pain relief, and that is similar to the pediatric. So if a child presented the accident and emergency. Uh, he needs to receive pain medication, effective pain medication within 30 minutes. Um, and, and, and that is important uh, because you don't meet that. And I can show you that those are the things that actually attract patients coming to any hospital. And also we emphasis in terms of managing patients jointly. I'm going to talk about renal problem tomorrow. It's important that you do not manage them only as a hematology or as a pediatrician, but please manage it with another person who has very special understanding about the problems. And therefore, join managing with other specialists, neurologists, nephrologists, uh, respiratory physicians is actually very essential and vital in terms of achieving the right outcome of sickle cell disease management. And the development of networks, um, okay, so, uh, Egypt, I know, um, I don't know, yeah, I, do, I know a bit about Egypt by what I read from the scriptures and everything, and you know, there's so much about Egypt, isn't it, in the scriptures. So, um, but obviously, if it's a big land, then it's important to think about services that can be supported by other services. Uh, so there is need for cooperation, there is need for learning, because there are some people that see more patients than you are seeing them, and they are going to actually learn and have a lot of experience, so actually if you share and discuss with them, then you actually benefit quite significantly, but who actually benefits much is your patient. So there is specialist commissioning, so in the UK, services are absolutely commissioned centrally. Um, and uh, you know that in the, in the, in the, in the UK, uh, services and care is actually available uh, for, at the point of need. Uh, and, and so we need to actually decide exactly what is provided and who provides the centers. So the centers will have very clear responsibilities. And therefore, to actually do that, we actually have this peer review. And the peer review process has happened on three occasions. So the peer review is looked at, is recorded. And also, do you know what? You can actually get the report online. It's available for you to see. And, and then we actually, so the other thing that has actually happened to make significant impact on the manual sick cell disease is the National Hemoglobin Registry. Uh, this is a registry that actually, you don't only have the patients on your center, but actually you need to know what happens to them yearly. So if they come, have you done, so you check annual review. When you do an annual review, you say, okay, has my patient had transcranial plus count if it's a pediatric patient? Has my patient had a renal assessment if, has the urine been checked? Or has the patient had, so you need to put all of those when they come for annual review. And annual review, I think, is something that is very key, and it has a lot of benefits to patients and a lot of benefits to the services and the outcomes for management of patients. Um, and so these are patients that actually, this is a program that I was trying to find out what do patients think about services? How do they feel about services? So this is kind of kind of a jumble kind of one, but actually to show some of the things that people are actually talking about. And then there were only kind of a very significant number of patients 
actually feel that some people don't really know about their conditions. They think that people do not even give them time to talk about their illnesses. They think people do not actually explain some treatment to them. And actually, you must appreciate the fact that, like I spend, um, so I spend about 20, 30, 40 minutes with one patient. But actually, some of them, the end of said, have, haven't had enough information about their treatment. They need to hear more and more information. So information is very key. And delivering the information in a way that is effective, that they hear, and then they follow it. And actually, support that with written information is actually very important. Otherwise, it's quite uh, challenging. And, and so the peer review process had gone through, and it's something that's going to continue because uh, so it's to make sure that standards were being achieved. Patients had variable access, unfortunately, when we looked at centers. But actually, it's to try and move people towards making sure that these services are delivered effectively. And also, um, and also in terms of the networks, to make sure that people work together. Uh, we are clinicians. Uh, obviously make sure that nurses work with us and we work with nurses and work with laboratory people but actually make sure that we work with the next hospital as well and actually uh, uh, if we are together we can achieve more. So there is a second edition of the adult standard and it's actually being launched today in London um, and that is available online. I actually wanted to bring some copies but I couldn't go back to the hospital but actually they're available online in terms of adult standards and I'll say a bit about the adult standard. Um, and it was to build on the recommendation of the previous one. And this is what happened. Uh, this was launched by the Sickle Cell Society. Sickle Cell Society is a patient group. And actually, um, but actually we are funded by a number of uh, organizations, including uh, pharma industries, uh, to actually establish a writing group and looking at different chapters and looking at all the different uh, components of care and actually have different boards, standing boards, to find actually what people thought about the standard. But the structure of the standard was like this. If you check it, it will be there online. Uh, general principles, management of acute and chronic complications, treatment and additional management issues, and appendices. And some of the evidences were kind of classified as class A evidence, or probably many based on a shared experience, based on those who have, um, have actually managed the conditions. And an example in terms of acute pain is that uh, we, we just make sure that pain management is actually kind of something that meets the goal, meets the requirement of the patient, uh, and, and also the families as well. So the overall action uh, standards in this new uh, one is general principle is that adults with sickle cell disease should be offered care close to home. Uh, obviously in pediatric maybe slightly different, but actually you need to think about it because care to home, close to home is very important. So if you have services that is offered close to home, you have to make sure that that service is actually up to scratch. It's effective, it's right. And obviously, if you do that, then obviously uh, that will meet the requirement. Uh, specialist uh, teams should actually participate in a quality review, and all consenting adults should be registered in the National Hemoglobin Registry. So the registry gives us an idea about how many patients we have in the United Kingdom. Um, and the transition services, uh, transition services are very key. I don't know how they are in Egypt, but actually transition services are key, and they are patchy in a number of countries. They are actually patchy, for example, in the United States of America. But for all the cause or the fact that the adult services are all entirely working on the same system, we can easily pass them from a pediatric to adult services in a similar manner. However, that needs a lot of action. That needs a lot of process. So we have found out that actually to do that, you actually need to have a team that actually is able to work towards um, achieving a seamless transfer. Because as pediatricians, we normally don't want to let our patients go to adult, 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 adult physicians. Um, and uh, parents don't want to leave us. And the children don't want to leave us. Sometimes the children want to go, but actually usually the mother and the doctor don't want the patient to go. Um, but actually, if we have an effective service that actually reassures the patient that they are going to a service that is very effective, that will be very helpful. And the acute pain management is very key. Those are some of the key things that you really need to make sure. I don't know how fast you actually respond to a patient that presents to you in action and emergency. You have to make sure that they actually receive their management in good time. Pain management is a very good standard that actually you can actually assess and see what, how is your patient doing. Um, and also in terms of prevention, prevention of infection, um, uh, penicillin prophylaxis, we give penicillin prophylaxis for life in, our, in, in the United Kingdom. Obviously the issue is adherence. How much adherence is there in terms of the penicillin prophylaxis? The issue is not supply, but actually the issue is adherence. Uh, and actually we've had patients that have died uh, even though they're supposed to be on penicillin prophylaxis, and actually die from infection that are actually kind of uh, sensitive to penicillin, unfortunately. Um, so it, it's important to make sure that uh, we ensure um, that uh, adherence is important. So one of the questions, however, is uh, should we conjunct uh, penicillin prophylaxis after the age of five? And that study has not been done. Whether it can be done now, uh, it's not very clear. 
But one of the major issues is that even when you give it, probably parents do not actually patients do not take it. I uh, mentioned about annual review. Annual review is very important. Annual review is good to actually have a clinic once in a year that actually you go through your patient and see have they done this investigation. If they are in transition, how much iron chelation have they received? What is the liver ferris scan? What is the what what are the eye changes? What are the hearing and everything? You need to kind of take a back step and actually review the patient. I don't know how many patients you have. Probably there are many numbers. That may be a challenge, but actually it's important to make sure that is met. Uh, and then also in terms of uh, uh, hydroxycarbamide, uh, we just have a new standard that's also being launched, uh, a new standard from the United Kingdom. Obviously, we took into account some of these recommendations from the United States, but actually there are slightly dif slight differences in the sense that we are not necessarily kind of go straight into hydroxia in the very first year of life, but actually we do we, I mean, we do kind of recommend that you should consider and discuss that at the earliest opportunities with the families. Um, imagine therapies and imagine services. Uh, obviously, how do we bring those into the NHS? How do you bring the new therapies that we know are actually coming on? How do you bring them through the NHS? Um, and so we have, uh, we have a body which is called a clinical reference group, and the reference group actually is responsible at looking at new therapies. I don't know whether you are using the L-glutamine yet in terms of the adult patients. In pediatric, we haven't implemented that. And there are certain more therapy that we know are actually coming in terms of some of the drugs that some of the companies are actually kind of doing. Um, but I, obviously, some of the key some of the key dates are the ones that are actually highlighted there. Um, and, and, and also, uh, I want to acknowledge some of my colleagues in our hospital, our guys in St. Thomas's, and, and, and also my pediatric team, uh, which I actually acknowledge. And so, finally, uh, just in terms of my acknowledgement, this is some of the people that actually have been very, very key in driving the services uh, for sickle cell uh, disease. Uh, this is Bishop Sentamu. He was the chair of the screening committee. He was very active, he was very committed, he very, but actually was well connected. He was a, brain, a friend of Blair, and they were able to actually make newborn screening a priority. So we need that connection. Um, and this is Alison Strilly. Alison Strilly, uh, she jokes to us, she says that uh, very important things come in small packages. Uh, she is, a, um, she was a passionate director of the newborn screening, and also uh, Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth Anyau is next to her. So um, it is, it is. I mean, quite a lot of them have actually had a lot of input in terms of uh, running newborn screening and also kind of implementing the whole services for sickle cell disease. But actually, if I had time, I would have told you some of the fact that a lot of new developments that have changed the management of sickle cell disease have actually happened through the United Kingdom. I think you can remember penicillin. We never talk about sickle cell disease, we're talking about penicillin. It was from the United Kingdom. So good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you very much, Professor, Professor Dr. Baba Inosa, for this interesting talk.